Good morning, everyone. I have 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the computer clock, so we will get started with today's training. I am Lorelai McKnight, the Asset Management Division Director in the Jacksonville Satellite Office. Today's training is Management Fee Review, and our presenter will be Patricia Hodges. Um, before we start today, today's training, I'd like to remind you of some participant guidelines. Please ensure your computer microphones are muted during the entirety of the training presentation. We recommend you disconnect from VPN to assist you in experiencing the best quality viewing and sound. Additionally, you may utilize the chat box to submit your questions or state any comments you may have. Those questions submitted in the chat box will be answered at the end of the presentation today during our Q&A portion. And with that, I will turn this training over to Ms. Hodges. Thank you. Thank you, Lorelai. Um, so I want to start this training off by showing you three that asset management has three management agreements. And I hope you can see. Can you see the what's on my screen that there's a management certification it says owner managed housing multifamily housing projects? Yes. OK, so this is the 9839A. This is to be used in the case of an owner managed. Owner managed means the owner 10 and the management agent 10 are exactly the same and identical. So that is considered an owner managed property. We don't have very many of those. Um, and yesterday there was a question asked about management agreements. Is a management agreement required for every management certification? And I did see the clarification, but I wanted to, to reiterate this. So the 4381.5 revision to chapter two, section 2.17, management fee requirements that applicability projects with identity of interest agents or independent fee agents must execute a management agreement. An agreement is recommended but not required for owner managed or projects managed by an administrator. So I just wanted to clarify that. So it, it's not a must for the owner managed or administrators, but it's highly recommended. So I just wanted to clarify that and then to show you what the difference in these management agreements are. So an a ma owner managed agreement looks pretty much just like the 9839B that versus an independent. There's probably a few languages that are different, but you know, you got the residential fees. Um, I think really the it's the signature page that's different. Because you know you're not. It's the owner and the agent. They're the same. They're agreeing to everything that an agent would, but only you need one signature. I'm going to skip to C, which is housing for elderly projects managed by administrators. This is kind of going away. Um, a lot of our older 811s and 202s, we used to have a sponsor, and the sponsor had a board of directors, and versus a management agent. So the board of directors was overseeing the property and they would hire an administrator. The administrator act as a management agent. So you might see in a fold in our folders where you have an administrator. An administrator doesn't get a fee. They get an actual salary. So if you it tells you they have to submit the position description, what the term of the employment is, um, the compensation, and then that's signed by only the owner. So I wanted to show you there are three different management certifications. Our training today is based on the requirements of the 9839B, which is for identity of interest or independent management agents. And for those of you that don't know what an identity of interest is, it's where there's a some commonality in the ownership and the management company. So some person that's in the main part of the ownership is also in the main part of the agent that creates the identity of interest. 
the ownership has a separate tin, the management has a separate tin, but usually they'll have usually the same general partner or you'll see a common name in both of the 2530s someplace. An independent management agent means that there's no um, there's no common denominator. There's no the owner and the agent are totally separate. They have no ownership interest shared at all. So I just wanted to clarify a little bit of that before we go into our training. OK. So the training that we're doing today is based on HUD Handbook 4381.5 Revision 2 Chapter 3. So there's three types of reviews. You have the upfront, after the fact, and no review. And most of us um, use the upfront message method, but it really is based on the type of property that you have. So for effective properties, an upfront review is required whenever an owner proposes a new management agent or requests a change in the fee percentages or they add a special fee or an add-on fee paid to the existing agent. The loan management, asset management staff determine the reasonableness of the proposed fee. So that's an upfront fee, or we review an upfront fee if the agents have not received previous approval from the HUD office, they're in default of their mortgage, or HUD determines an upfront fee is required or needed for reasons such as poor financial, physical condition, or non-compliance issues. After the fact, um, are, for, are for projects, um, the owner agents may establish and charge a management fee amount listed in the project's budget without prior HUD approval. Owner agents must submit a new management certification prior to changing the management fee for a project. Projects not subject to an upfront fee review that fall into any of these categories. They have a limited distribution. They're nonprofit projects, regardless of how project rents are set. Limited and nonprofit. It's not one or the other. Sorry, I just want to clarify that. It's limited distribution and our nonprofit projects. Profit motivated Section 8 projects subject to budgeted rent reviews and subsidized cooperative projects. This is a strong point. No review is required. So we don't review the fee at all. So up front, we have to review and agree to the fee. It has to be in compliance with our fee range that's established. After the fact, the person can go ahead and start paying that fee, but we look at it after it's implemented. We, they don't have to get pre HUD approval to do it, and then we still review it and approve it. Where there's no fee, no review of the fee whatsoever is for profit motivated projects that do not have a rental assistant contracts. Those are your market rate properties. Profit motivated Section 8 projects that have rent set through the use of an annual adjustment factor. Profit motivated preservation projects that use the OCAF operating cost adjustment factor to determine the rent adjustments or unsubsidized cooperatives in Section 234D condominium projects. So no review is required on these types of properties. And the reason no fee is required is because it doesn't really matter what they pay. One, these are all the profit motivated. They're competitive projects, so they might pay a fee that's going on in the market that they're in, but in the bottom line, it hits the owner's pocket. So the only thing it affects is the owner distribution at the end of the year, how much fee they're paying. So th th that's why it really doesn't matter what fee they're, they'll find. And a lot of it you'll see, um, you'll notice in a subsidized project, the fee is higher than a market rate. So market rate properties usually are at 3% and our HUD subsidized can be 7, 8, 9% as long as they're when the management certification when it's first submitted is in that, you know, that range, we're okay. 
the no fee would also review would also be those projects coming in pr production that don't have section eight. So any of your 223Fs, your D4s. Now we want them to complete section four or section one of page four because we need to enter that in IRIMS. And the reason the no fee per unit per month needs to be in there is because that is what HUD uses to determine the applicable ranges of our properties by state. We pull that data every two years and look to see what the except what the real world is paying for management fees and that's what we determine our ranges to be now we can also adjust it by the um, cpi i believe so um, the ranges are going to change this year on our region so i'm not sure which method they're going to use so the types of fees so there's a, a residential income commercial income miscellaneous income special fees and add-on fees. Residential fees are HUD specifies the kinds of income that may be treated as residential income when determining the resident income fee. Income received from the rental of housing units may be counted as residential income. Do count apartment rents, co-op carrying charges, rent sub payments, wrap payments, Section 8 tenant assistant payments, including utility reimbursement payments pay made to the residents. Um, do not count special claims, excess rents, and charges for Section 236 when rent paid is greater than the basic rent. Section 236, that applies to Section 236 um, properties, and then you can't charge a residential fee, a, a fee on the 236 interest reduction payments. We don't have a lot of 236 projects left in our inventory as um, they're maturing out or they prepaid. So we have a few, but not many. Um, most sources of commercial income may be counted when establishing the income base for this fee. You count um, rent receipts from commercial space, fees for parking spaces and garages, collection uh, charges collected by the agent for additional services not included in uh, project rates, maybe for valet trash pickup. And if you all don't know that, at some of our market rate properties, they put a container outside your unit and instead of you having to take your trash to the trash dump, you put it in this little box and it's picked up, you know, daily or they establish a time and you pay for that service. It's called valet garbage. Um, you don't count for charges for services paid directly to an outside vendor or contractor. Miscellaneous income. So HUD allows management agents to earn fees only on selected types of miscellaneous income. You count laundry and concession income, which is coin machines, or if you have a car wash on site, you know, where you put money in, uh, charges collected from residents, such as fees for damages, bad checks, late payments, proceeds from loss of rents um, from insurance policies, income from furniture or equipment and other um, charges shown on the HUD approved rent schedule. Um, you can, they can charge for pet fees or cleanup, et cetera, but do not include um, a fee from a pet deposit. Do not include as a miscellaneous income interest earned on invested security deposits r for r reserved for replacement residual receipts section 8 special claims for unpaid rent vacancy loss debt service or residential damage flex sub funds refunds from property tax or utility rate appeals proceeds from property damage or liability insurance policies recovered legal fees or court costs replacement reserve and residual receipt reimbursements to the project. So that is not allowed. So special fees. So in addition to HUD letting them take a percentage of residential, commercial or miscellaneous, they can also earn a special fee. This has to be listed in their management agreement and they have to put it on their management certification. So in addition to the percentage based fee described previously, 
owners may agree to pay special management fees if a project has special needs or problems. Proposing special fees rather than adjusting the fee percentage is an appropriate and cost effective way to address specific project conditions that should be temporary in nature. So just to clarify, so that statement for appropriate and cost effective. So maybe they're doing a rehab at the property and in the management agreement, it says any cost over 25,000, just as an example, the owner, the agent is going to see receive a special fee to oversee that rehab. So it's costing them more work. So they want a special fee. This rehab is only going to be for a specific time frame. So if this rehab happens, then they need to come to HUD, add the special fee on, and the special fees are only for a specific time frame. They're not indefinite. So this property, and it would, you don't want to change the fee and it make the fee higher because if it's one of those properties where we review the fees, if you raise the fee, it could put them out of the range. So every time they change that management percentage, they have to be within the applicable fee ranges. And I'll address that a little bit more detail in a little bit. Um, so back to special fees. Agents may earn special fees only if all six of the conditions listed below are met. And this is in accordance with section 3.6. The agent did not cause the problem the fee is de uh, designed to address. The fee is tied to correct the specific problem or accomplish a specific task. The fee is structured so that there is a payable only if the agent completes the required actions or attains the required results. The fee does not include services that are covered by residential, commercial, and miscellaneous management fees or by other sources of compensation. The fee is reasonably related to the time, effort, and expertise required of the agent, and the fee is paid for a limited period of time. The length of this period should, should be no longer than the time required to resolve a specific problem or complete a specific task. And then I've got two side notes here. So market rate properties should not include any special incentive fees on their management certification. Those can only be paid from surplus cash. Lease up fees that are flat fees come from working capital and a, a true management fee can only be paid based on residential income collected. So we've got a management. In, so um, this is referring to a new construction property as well. So it's more targeted to. So you got a new construction property, it's being built. Their management fee is 5%. Well, sometimes they do 5% or 5,500, whichever's less. Well, HUD doesn't, or more, which HUD doesn't recognize a flat fee. We only recognize a percentage of residential income collected. Now, when they get full occupancy, they'll probably exceed that 5,500. Is the agent doing work? Well, yes, they are doing work. They're leasing up the property, but um, I, there's some wiggle room in working capital is my understanding. If there's someone out there in production um, that would like to add anything to this, please raise your hand. Um, but there is fees in working capital to cover lease up expenses. There might not be a lot, but there are fees for that. It also, if they do incentive fees saying, oh, if you rent so many pro uh, units a month, we'll pay you X, Y, Z. Well, that's not in accordance with our, our residential fee calculation. So that has to come from the owner. It can't come from the property. So um, it can get sticky during lease up and that they want to pay these flat fees, but there's no residential income to pay it. So it's got to be paid from other sources, working capital or from the owner entity. They can only pay a fee based on the residential income they collect. Um, and then a side note, another an agent may not collect a special man management fee for supervising rehab work for those services that are being paid through, it's called a BRISPA, Builder Sponsor Profit and Risk Allowance, 
which is a construction oversight fee. And this would apply to new construction and sub rehab properties. And if you look at your firm commitments, the documents in that will tell you if it's if there's a BRISPA paid. So if an um, agent came in and wanted a special fee added on to their certification to cover oversight of a rehab and it's brand new to production, you need to look and find out if it's covered by BRISPA or not. Um, so again, a special fee is for a specific task. It's for a specific time frame. Add-on fees are totally different than a special fee. A special fee is time sensitive. An add-on fee, it's not time limited. It's indefinite. Unless one of the circumstances that you're giving the special fee no longer applies. So. Um, I'm just going to read this slide and then go over it. Only after computation of the permitted percentages for residential, commercial, and miscellaneous income have been determined and approved by HUD may add-on fees be considered. In approving permissible percentage fees, the per unit per month yield must fit with the range established by the HUD office. Although the total yield, including the add-on fee, may exceed the range, add-on fees may not be used to increase this range and in turn increase the percentage fee. Add-on fees are a flat dollar amount per unit fee paid to agents managing projects with long-term project characteristics or conditions that require additional management effort beyond the activities covered by the residential management fee. For example, scattered site projects will often require greater management effort than a single site property. The HUD area office will establish a schedule of project characteristic conditions that warrant add-on fees and a flat fee amount for each characteristics and condition. Only add-on fees for the Southeast region um, are, and this is the memo dated May 15th, 2020. So again, these fees are updated or adjusted every two years, so I expect something to come out in 2022. This is on the toolbox, and if somebody could pull up that memo and attach it into the chat box, I would appreciate it. So these are region specific fees. Each rate, each region um, establishes their own special fee and their own management fee range. So for the Southeast, a homeless preference special fee is uh, two fifty. Is the add-on fee of two fifty? And then let me see. Homeless preference special fee is two fifty, and then they can do an additional add-on fee of two dollars. Better business challenge incentive per unit per month is up to $4. Subsidy mix is $3 per unit per month. And that means it's got tax credits. It's got Section 8. You know, that's a subsidy mix. Uh, remote co location or scattered sites are $3 per unit per month. Uh, cooperative ownership is $5 per unit per month. High density projects are $3 per unit per month. Adverse neighborhood is $5 per unit per month. And I'm just, I'm looking in the handbook to pull up these special fees for these add on fees. In the handbook, when you look for add on fees and their references, so this is in accordance with section 3.21. Um, the handbook's very specific about looking to see what's required to be submitted and so is the memo. So like if you have an adverse neighborhood condition, there's the memo describes what it is and they have to prove to you that this situation is applicable. Um, this is not just a given. We don't just say, oh, by the way, you can get all these fees or if the property is mixed subsidy, we don't add it on. The agent has to and the owner have to request it from HUD. So let me see if I can pull this memo up that was just put in the chat box.
Thank you, Asia Milo, for posting it. So this is what the memo looks like. It was signed by Don Billingsley. And this is our fee ranges by state, by unit. So if a management agent, if you're required to do an upfront or after the fact review, whatever their fee percentage is, you look on page four of the per unit per month dollar figure. And as long as it falls into these ranges, we can approve it. If it's over these ranges, then they're going to have to reduce their management fee. They can only when the, the management certification first comes in. These are the, the ranges that they have to be in line with. Now, will that fee increase? Probably the very next year. But when they come in to get that percentage, it must be in the same percentage in, in the range that HUD has established for your region. The other thing is we have properties that are coming in for rehab and any new business agreement or transaction can cause you to relook at this fee. So if a project comes in and gets a new HUD loan, that's asset management's opportunity to get the fees back in line with the, the ranges because it's a new it's a new management certification. So if they get a new HUD loan, that's a new management certification and they must be in compliance with the fees. Now we're going to go over capping and um, excuse me, I need to get a drink. Um, we're going to go on when to cap a management fee, but you don't cap a management fee just because the management certification fee that they have when they submit it is at the maximum fee range. That is not when you cap a fee. There's only very few specific reasons you can cap a management fee and very few of them exist today. So um, back to the cut off target, sorry. Um, <clears throat> here it talks about your add on fees. So like for a homeless preference, um, there's a housing memorandum dated October 2016 from Praia and it promotes the use of homelessness and it tells you um, they'll let you do a special fee for nine months and then they will go to 250 per month not to exceed 4500. Um, the better business challenge it's in accordance with this memorandum and it tells you that what they can get you know per unit per month but it's up to four dollars um, it really gives you a good definition what subsidy mix is, who it applies to, um, remote locations or scattered co-ops, high density. Um, high density projects are eligible projects um, that those have a high percentage of three or more bedroom unit sizes, which is in key, increases the popul population density. Um, projects must meet the definition of high density um, which is a site with an average of not less than 2.5 bedrooms per unit. Um, adverse uh, neighborhood, so it's a high instance of crime and vandalism or a large concentration of deteriorated or substandard housing in the surrounding area. And then they have to show and support all of one through four in order to get that. Um, and then we're going to talk more about um, computer and book keep, bookkeeping fees. So um, I'm going to go back to my presentation. And again, if we have any questions on that, we'll get to them at the end. So not an add on or special fee. Computer and bookkeeping fees are treated as a project's expense. The expense, however, must not exceed the actual cost the project would incur if a bookkeeper were on site. And so this is in accordance with that section of the handbook. And so you really on your budgets should not be seeing um, a flat fee for computer bookkeeping fees. Um, for those that have us been around for a while, we did used to have computer and bookkeeping fees. But that wasn't in accordance with the handbook, so they're based on actual expense. So if somebody says um, if they have an outside vendor, 
maybe they'll have be charged four fifty per unit to do their bookkeeping and accounting. But if they're prorating staff to do bookkeeping, it's a certain percentage of their salary um, time allocated to do that bookkeeping for that site. And I'm just going to give an example. So we've got a man. All the bookkeeping is done in the management's main headquarters office. They have one person doing all the accounts payable for five projects. All five projects are 100 units. So all five projects, if she, based on the number of units, her time would be split or his time would be 20% at each property if they're all like. If one unit's 100 and one property is 20, then you're going to have 80% at the 100 unit property and 20% at the property. That's why it goes back to what we talked about yesterday is we need to know what salaries are being charged to our properties and how the salaries are being allocated. Um, because the other thing is that expense cannot be more than if you hired an outside bookkeeper. So every, I believe the handbook says every three years or two years, um, they need to go and solicit outside vendors to see if it would be cheaper for them to do the bookkeeping than do it on site with the agent's office. Because remember also that person that's doing the accounts payable, that supervisor salary also gets prorated to the property. So both of those expenses have to be less than the actual costs than if it was done outside. But it, it should not be a flat fee unless it's you know, it's proven that's what the amount is. Um, computer is a little different. You might see a, a flat fee on that, but if they do charge a flat fee for a computer, you really should um, review it and look at it. Hold harmless provision. So if you remember, if anybody has ever entered um, a management fee into IRIMS, it asks you, are these fees held harmless or are they capped? So if you see a yes, it's probably shouldn't be. And I'm gonna tell you why over these next few slides. HUD instituted reasonableness reviews of management fees on August 1st, 1986. So this rule was established in 86. The handbook we're using is from 94. These rules have not changed since 94. So if an owner in, or agent is, in, is seeking increase in the residential management fee in that agent's current management agreement, again, we're back to that management agreement that ties with the management certification. So this is only applicable to identity of interest and independent agents. That if the agent's current management agreement was executed prior to August 1st, 1986, specific hold harmless provisions may apply to the review of the residential fee. I don't think we have very many management agreements that are still in play from 1986. We might, um, you know, if the property was built after 86, this is not going to apply. It's only for these older properties. So management fee changes. So any management agreement executed after 1986 are subject to HUD review and use ranges to determine the approvable fee. So anything now, after 86, we use go back to our letter and make sure the fee is in line with our region. Pre 86 means anything before 1986 for fixed term agreements. So use ranges to determine the approvable fees, just like you do the post. Again, it's a fixed term. So right now those probably don't exist because a fixed term normally would have been five years, so that would have expired. So I don't think you will ever find any fixed terms from 
before 1986, but it's in the handbook. I wanted to cover it. So pre-86 open-ended agreements. This we might still have a few. Um, but again, it's going to be based on, you know, the year it became a HUD property and when the management agent started. Any increase to the fee percentage must result in a yield within the range limits. However, the old percentage may continue to be used even if the yield exceeds the range limits. I think there's a, an example on this. We'll see if I can find that example real quick. Um, again, I know we're going to get into some discussion about um, when this is capped and when it isn't. Um, but really, the only time you're going to cap a fee um, is is way is back in this renewals with a pre 86 open ended, and I don't think we have very many. Renewals of pre-86 fixed terms, if the fee percentage is not increased, but the current fee yield exceeds the range, oh, excuse me, this is when you cap the yield. At the current yield, adjust the fee percentage by dividing the cap per unit per month by the new monthly rent potential. So it's renewals from pre-1986 with fixed terms. That's the only time you can cap a management fee. You cannot cap a management fee any other time than in this. So management fees, how do they play in with rent increases? So project based rent increases for projects where rents are set through an expense based rent formula. HUD will use the approved management fee percentage in processing all rent increase requests. The approved fee percentage is used regardless of the fee yield provided by this percentage fee except where the provisions of a cap fee percentage of projects receiving significant rent increase or adjusting the management fee for rent decreases. Again, you're only going to have a cap fee if it's a pre 86 fixed agreement. The handbook is very specific in section four about capping these fees and when they're capped. And there's only one instance you can cap a management fee. Now we will adjust it based on how high a rent increase is or if we decrease rents, but we don't um, mess with that fee yield. We know it's going to go over. And as example, last year had approved a management fee of 5% at Project X. At that time, this management fee provided a potential fee yield of $25 per unit per month. This year, the owner is applying for a budget based rent increase. In processing the requested low man in processing the request, low management staff will use the management fee of 5%. If the 5% fee should result in the potential fee yield of $28 and this amount exceeded the upper limit of the reasonable range of 26 for that area, low management staff would use the approved fee and no cap will be placed on the fee yield. This example is straight from the handbook. I did not make this up. This this is straight out of the handbook. So again, you're going to use the HUD approved fee. If it exceeds the per unit per month, that's OK. The only time we can make them go back in that fee range is if they change the management percentage. So every time they change the fee back in earlier, you know, our earlier part of the training, it said when the owner changes the percent of fee paid, do they have to get HUD approval? So that HUD approval lets us make it be in the range. So that's why you don't see them messing with the range. You will you will not see a management agent really come in and change that percentage. And what I've seen when helping um, some of our newer staff do um, rent increases, process prac rent increases, somebody might have a, a fee of $50 per unit per month, which exceeds 
you know, when you do the calculation based on their percentage of seven, eight, nine percent, it comes out to like sixty dollars per unit per month. But they're only charging the property fifty. So how do you do your rent increase? You almost can't because you can't figure out what percent they're using and they're entitled to be paid based on the percentage, not a flat fee. So I just want to clarify that, you know, they, we don't approve flat fee management fees. It says the resident, the fee collected is based on a percentage of residential income collected. It doesn't say 50 units per month. So it has to be a percentage. And if it's not, or they're ca not capping it, in some cases, the percentage was be, was way below what the management fee was allowed. So we went back to that owner and said, you know, here's what the management fee is. You can change your management fee and that's what we're basing our rent increase on. So just be mindful that it could happen. And if your numbers don't work out um, or they are not charging a lot of management fee, um, that could be your problem in, in the fees. Let's see. The point I'm trying to make in this training is you don't adjust if the fee range goes over the allowed amount during a rent increase, it's OK. Now, if the, this is if the rent increase is less than 20 percent. If the rent increase is 20 percent or less of the current rent potential, the current management fee percentage fee is applied to the new potential, even if the yield which is derived is greater than the established range. If the increase is 20, is, it's actually more than 20% or more, adjust the fee down. So if the increase is greater than 20%, should be 21% of the current rent potential, calculate the fee yield using the current fee percentage and the net rent potential for a 20% increase. Adjust the management fee percentage by dividing the calculated deal by the new rent potential and you use the new management fee potential for future rent increases. Enter the new fee yield on the management certification that was approved by HUD and sent to the management agent. <clears throat> and then I don't know if I put the calculation in the spreadsheet or not. Yes, so here's the here's the calculation. So when you do the current fee yield tightens the number of unit. Um, and then and then you use a vacancy factor when rents are reduced as well um, are reduced as a result of a refinance or other reason permitted by HUD regulation HUD will also adjust the residential management fee percentage in order to ensure that agents retain their current yield in readjusting the percentage the following formula is used this adjusted percentage fee will apply to all future rent potentials without regard to the fee range limits until such. Whoops, sorry. But what happened? Sorry about that. Sorry, apologize for that. Um, The adjusted percentage will apply to all future rent potentials without regard to the fee range until such time as the agent requests a change in the percentage fee. Um, and then you you would take the last approved management certification and on page three you fill out the box that says new fee yield and you send it back to the owner and agent. So the resources for this are the HUD Handbook 4381.5 Revision 2, the Don Billingsley uh, Memorandum dated May 15th, 2020 um, for the Southeast Region 2020 Management Fee. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So um, will someone wants to, we'll look into those questions and see if we, can't get them answered. Or if you want to raise your hand, either way would be great.
We, uh, we this is Leslie. Leslie. We have, we one, have question one question in the chat. chat. Hold, on Hold on a second. second. I'm um, Trisha. Um, at the end of the meeting in the Q&A, would you please talk about requirements for USDA 515s? Well, I'm going to tell you what the handbook says. So we've been dealing with this in our office. We've had um, several properties where the management agent company was bought and they have a list of properties um, that are rural development and 515s. So Chapter two of the handbook, section C, says the um, the administration for rural housing and economic development services has authority approval for all rural development 5158 projects. The the office must submit the rural housing development office must submit a previous participation certification of the proposed agent to for all of their 5158 projects as described in paragraph 2-9a. With respect to all other procedures discussed in this chapter, rural develop may develop its own criteria to elect the procedures established. So technically, they are supposed to review it. What we're doing in our particular office on this case, you now please Milo or Josh correct me if I'm mistaken about what we're doing. We want rural development because the management agreements that we saw, they say that rural develop must approve it and the fee is a rural development approved fee. So we need rural development to approve the management agreement. We're going to and then we're going to process it accordingly. We're going to do the management certification, make sure they've got the management entity um, and and so on and so forth. But we want rural development to approve the agreement and we're going to process the documents as normal um, because we do have somebody that came from rural development in our office and we spoke with them and they said as far as they know rural development has never approved a management company. So we don't want to stop this process either, but we need to work with the owner and rural development and get it processed. But the handbook says rural development is supposed to do everything but the 2530. But I don't really know how far you're going to. We want them to at least approve the management agreement. Thank you, Trish. There are no additional questions at this time in the chat. OK, so um, that is our training. Um, again, look at chapter three in depth. Yeah, hey, uh, Trisha. Yes, uh, this is Peggy. Um, I, I have a question. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer because it's about a specific situation. But I have a property where uh, it's listed in REMS <clears throat> and the 9839A says it's self-managed, but they have a guy who his signature line or s seems to say he's with another company. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what, what they're doing there. Could they sub So um, they were probably contracted by the owner. And let me just say, we do not allow split management agents. So you can't have this management company doing this function, this management company doing another function. Um, he's probably hiring them as a consultant and it can't come out of project operations. It would, you know, so I would just look into it and find out who that person is. Maybe they are an employee of the owner. So I would. That's if what it, he's supposed to be, right? He's supposed to be an employee of. Of the owner. Yes, he should not be it? employed by another company. He should be employed by the owner if the owner is is also the management, if it's self-managed. Yeah, OK. So I hope everybody um, got something out of this training and clarified about CAPI management fees. And if you have any questions that you don't want to bring up on training or you would like some type of clarification like we did yesterday, please feel free to do that. Um, and if anything needs to be clarified, I will gladly send that out.
Yeah, I so, think everybody's looking for the PowerPoint probably. I believe Leslie put it out right at the beginning. Yes, oh, okay. the PowerPoint is in the chat in the very beginning, um, at the very top of the chat. Yep. This recording also will be, um, this is recorded and will also be listed in Compass at a later date for those who were not able to see that and the PowerPoint will be attached in Encompass as well. All right, well, with no other questions and no hands raised, I we can conclude this. So everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you guys for attending. Have a great day. Goodbye.